Chapter 2 Slavery Days Was Hell I could tell you about it all day, but even then you couldn't guess the awfulness of it. Delia Garlick, ex-slave, from Voices from Slavery July, 1861 Obi rose from his crouching position. The mule stood next to him, swishing its tail. The two sacks tied behind the animal were filled with tobacco leaves. Guessing by the position of the sun, Obi figured it was about three o'clock. They had already been working for eight hours. He caught a glimpse of Easter in the next field. All he actually saw was part of her homespun dress, which looked like a dab of white paint on a sea of green leaves. Little Jason was stumbling over to her, carrying a bucket of water. Master John Jennings and his wife Martha were hidden by the tall stalks of tobacco. They were in a field that was in front of the field where Obi worked. He turned around, looking in the direction of the farmhouse and the barn. Wilson, Master John's brother, was by the barn bundling tobacco leaves. His black slouch hat hid his face. Two brown and white hounds lay in the shade of a magnolia tree nearby. Hope Wilson keep he evil self there, Obi said to himself. Pushing back his wide straw hat, he wiped his forehead and watched Jason walk toward Master John and Martha with the water. Obi, Easter, and Jason were slaves. They worked on the Jennings farm in South Carolina, nearly thirty miles from Charleston. Easter was about thirteen, and Obi sixteen or seventeen. Jason was seven years old, and the only one who knew his correct age because he was born on the farm. The children were the only slaves that Jennings owned, and were their most valuable property worth more than the mules and the mare. Wilson was part owner of the farm, too, but up until recently he'd hardly ever been around. He'd left years ago and came back only for rare visits. John Jennings would tell people that his brother was a soldier of fortune, making money through adventuresome activity, he would say. Wilson had worked on merchant ships and sometimes on slavers. It was Wilson who had brought Obi, Easter, and Jason's mother, now dead, to the farm. He came home permanently when the Civil War began. The children fared better than many other slaves. They ate the same rice, grits, beef, pork, vegetables, and salt fish the family did. They weren't beaten and were given warm clothes in winter. The Jennings had no children of their own. John, a lanky, quiet man, wasn't comfortable in the role of master the way his brother was. He refused to rule by the lash, and he once told Wilson as much. Lately, however, though he hated to admit it to his brother, John Jennings recognized that having two healthy young slaves like Easter and Obi was a sound investment. Even Jason might be worth some money one day. Martha did not approve of the idea of owning other people, but she had to keep her feelings to herself. Every time she saw a group of slaves chained together, being shipped from the Charleston slave market to some other part of the state, she'd say to herself, We're going to pay for this sin one day. Still, Obi had often thought of running away to find his mother. Time had blurred the image of her face from his mind, but he'd never forgotten her name or the sounds of her screams when he was sold away. He also remembered being in a dark place and a man who held his hand. Most of all, he remembered how much he missed her. Sometimes he heard her cries when birds screeched or the wind howled during a storm. Obi's mother had been a slave on a large rice plantation on one of the sea islands off the South Carolina coast. Obi dreamed of returning to the island, finding her, and escaping with her to Mexico, though he hadn't the faintest idea of where Mexico might be. It was merely the name of a place he'd heard that slaves ran to. Making plans for running was a secret game that Obi played with his friend Buka. Buka was an old African who lived by the creek where the farm ended. The children of his last master didn't want him, said he was too old and difficult. I so old no one want to buy or sell my hide, he'd tell Obi. For Obi, Buka was a living adventure who loved to talk and tell stories. Most of the tales were about running away and about his memories of Africa. We was growing rice in Africa, too. That's why these Carolina slavers like to steal us coastal Africans, he'd say. The most important story Buka told was Obi's family's history, as Buka called it. Your mother tall with skin like a beautiful dark night. 
She eyes sit deep inside she face like yours. She cry fierce when the man take you from her to put you on the boat. Since I be in sold with you and the others, I tell her that I take care of you. I put my arms around you because you yellin' to wake the dead, too. As we walk on the boat, the last thing she cried to you is, Remember your mama's name, your mama named Lorena. You still cling to me when we reach the slave pen at the Charleston Market. You was six or seven years old. Then, <clears throat> that ship captain buy you and take you to his house in Charleston. Master Graves buy me and bring me to this area. The last thing I say to you when we separate is, remember your mama name. When Wilson bring you to the farm three years later, I knew it you, because you have your mama face, and I never forget she face. I say to you, what your mama's name? You say Lorena. Obi remembered the rest of the story himself. He remembered cleaning and working on the captain's ship when it was in port, and the black cook in the captain's house, who beat Obi every time the captain's wife beat her, which was often. He remembered the day Wilson and the captain argued over money. The captain pointed to Obi and said, Take the nigger in payment, and that's more than you deserve. Hear the water, Obi, Jason said, interrupting his thoughts. Obi dipped the tin cup and drank the cold, sweet water down quickly. He dipped the cup again. Jason wiped his small face with his shirt tail. His thin, bare feet were almost indistinguishable from the soil. When you take the tobacco to Mr. Master Phillips, I come too? It ain't up to me no more. There was nothing Jason liked better than going to the Phillips plantation, where there were children his age. The plantation was a mile west of the farm. Many of the small farmers in the county sold their crops to the Phillips plantation with its large number of acres and slaves. John Jennings had his tobacco cured and separated according to quality at the plantation before selling it at the market. I ask mistress, Jason said. She let me go. She can't say if you go neither. You ask Wilson or Master John. I'm afraid of Wilson. Obi drank more water. Stay out, he way. Jason kicked the dirt. You ain't no more baby, Obi said. You finished shelling the peas? No, Jason mumbled. Obi grabbed Jason's ear and the boy cried out. Is that I mean, said Obi. You ain't finished your task and you asking to go to plantation. You know Wilson going to take that up with you. I keep telling you, do your task so we don't bother you. Jason picked up the bucket. Mistress won't let him beat me, he whined. Obi bent down and started pulling the bottom leaves from the stalk of a plant. What'd she do? Wilson catch you when she ain't looking. Obi knew that Jason was probably right. As long as John and Martha were there, Wilson wouldn't beat them. But he wanted Jason to learn how to protect himself. Stop letting Wilson catch you with your britches down, Jason. Ain't got no britches. Jason's eyes were teary. His long shirt was made of sacking and stopped at his skinny knees. Obi stifled a laugh. Finish shelling and go help Easter. I ask Wilson or Master if you can come with me if I go tomorrow morning. Jason's little face lit up. You think they be more soldiers there? I don't know. Get on to your tasks now. Thank you, Obi, Jason sang as he ran, swinging the bucket and tripping over his own feet. Last month, when Obi and Jason were at the plantation, they saw Tyler, the eldest Philip's son, ride off to join the Confederate Army. Obi remembered how handsome Tyler, Tyler had looked sitting on his horse with a finely crafted saber gleaming at his side. Be back for supper. This won't take long, he had said cheerfully as he waved to the house servants. They had gathered in the yard to see their young master off. Jeremiah, one of the Philip's slaves, had ridden off with him. The saber and Jeremiah were gifts to Tyler from his father. That night, Obi had gone to Buka's shack. You think this war be good or bad for us, he had asked him. I don't know, Buka has said. We have to watch and wait. North and south fight but these white men still be brothers. Obi worked faster now, even though the sun felt as if it were burning a hole in his back. If he could get a good portion of his field done, he'd be able to help Easter, so she'd have a sizable crop picked before sundown. An hour later, he looked over at the girl. She didn't seem to be making much progress. His heart sank when he turned and saw Wilson walking toward the fields, pulling his wide black slouch hat over his eyes. 
He was of medium height, but thick and muscular. Peace gone now, Obi said to himself and sighed. This all you get done, Wilson said loudly, as he approached Obi. We ain't going to be doing this come next month. It be done for then, Obi said quietly, as he continued working. I know it'll be done. I'm making sure of that. His face was red and coarse from his days on the sea, and now the Carolina sun. And what's wrong with that gal? He stared in Issa's direction. She's sick or something? The veins in Wilson's temple throbbed. Obi knew that an answer wasn't expected of him. Working best she can. Just a girl. Ain't no mule, he thought. Wilson strode as if he were balancing himself on a ship's deck, heading toward the field where Easter worked. Obi took his mule back to the barn so he could empty the sacks now filled with tobacco leaves. He piled the leaves on top of the others that had to be bundled. A little later he trudged back to the fields. Instead of going to his field, however, he walked hesitantly over to Wilson and Easter. Easter looked helpless as Wilson pointed to the leaves. Gal, I'll wrap my belt round your legs and have you running through these leaves like a jackrabbit if you don't stop playing, he yelled at her. Her full bottom lip trembled as she stared at the ground. Obi wanted to fling Wilson to the other end of the field. What do you want, Wilson shouted when he saw Obi watching him. I help her, sir, Obi said. You got your own work. The veins in his temple looked as if they might burst. I do mine and help her. The crowd be in four month end, sure. Wilson stuck his stubby finger in Obi's face. This is July 25th. You've got six days. I don't care what my brother says. That crop ain't in. Your hide going to be tanned good. Hers, too. He stared from one to the other. Remember this. War or no war, they're still buying and selling black tails in the Charleston market. Get rid of y'all and buy me some real hands. He walked away from them. Easter's small shoulders slumped. She was short and slender, and her thick braids were covered with a piece of blue cloth to protect her head from the sun. He's mean as a snake, she said near tears. Her hands were black and gummy like Obie's from the tobacco leaves. A smudge streaked across one of her brown cheeks. Her lively eyes often curled easily into a smile when she laughed, but now they looked tired and frightened. He ain't selling or beating nobody. I never let him beat you. Master John won't let him either. Just evil cause he have to work like us, Obi said. Obi, you touch him, he try and kill you. No, he won't. Give me a lash or two, he said, smiling. Then Master John stop him. I don't like talking of selling, she said, frowning. We always been together, you and me and Jason. She yanked a leaf off the stalk. And why he so said about the crop being in for August? I've been wondering the same thing, Obi answered. He brushed the back of his hand lightly over the two lines that appeared on her forehead whenever she was worried. Stop bothering yourself. Wilson just like a barking dog. Ain't gonna bite, he said bravely. Easter flexed her tired fingers. Master John never drive us to finish cropping for August. Jason struggled across the field with another bucket of water, headed for John and Martha. When he finished with them, he brought Easter and Obi their water. You finish that shellin', Obi asked him. He nodded. I help you and Easter now. Easter smiled at Jason. Sing us a song. Make time go fast. Jason sang a song he'd learned from the children on the Phillips plantation as he pulled the leaves from a stalk. His voice was high-pitched and clear. Easter picked up the tune and soon had the words. Obi never sang, but a peacefulness came over him as he listened to their young voices. They worked continuously for the next two hours until Obi stopped. Go get us some water, he called to Jason, motioning to Easter to come and sit beside him. They watched Jason run to the well in the yard close to the house. Wilson came out of the barn and called Jason to him. Get no water now, Obi muttered in disgust. Jason was walking over to Wilson when Jesse, the overseer from the Phillips plantation, rode into the yard. Wonder what happened, Easter asked. Obi and Easter watched in silence as Jesse climbed off his horse and tied it to a tree. He and Wilson spoke for a minute, then they both walked quickly to the field where John and Martha were still working. Jason raced toward Obi and Easter. Tyler dead, he yelled from the hedges where the field began. Overseer says Yankees killed him. <laughs>